All right, so this is InfoSec Decoded number 3611. And we're starting with Liz with Microsoft SEO poisoning. Yeah, I thought this was kind of, it's a very simple story, but it's kind of ingenious. So uh, these um, uh, uh, bad people uh, have start, found a new way to uh, attract uh, hapless office drones into their web of deception. Um, essentially, they have been using a uh, search engine optimization poisoning by um, stacking the results with lots and lots of um, search results for various uh, business forms like like uh, invoices, questionnaires, receipts, resumes, um, stuff like that. And uh, it is a great way to, um, to infect folks with uh, remote access Trojans. So uh, look out if you're, if you're looking for some of those free forms on the internet, maybe be a little careful before you want to even visit one of those websites. So they just put up PDFs with keywords that attract churches. Yeah, I mean, and it's quite simple and pretty ingenious, so. Yeah, it's like a watering hole attack then. Yep, exactly. Okay, yeah, that's good. And Caitlin, more of the chip shortages. Yes, we have more chip shortage news. Um, Ars Technica has an article written by Tim uh, Salter uh, going over the fact that there are a lot more counterfeit chips uh, being circulated right now than normal. Uh, and normally there's a lot of counterfeit chips. So <laughs> things are getting a lot worse. Um, and this is of course due to the supply chain difficulties we're having at the moment. Um, and so, so for people that, that don't do a whole lot of low level electronics uh, assembly, uh, counterfeits are pretty commonplace. If you go on eBay and you need to get a chip that was manufactured in like 1992 or something, uh, you sort of kind of have to take your chances. Uh, sometimes you'll get a legit chip, uh, sometimes you won't. Um, and the, the people who fake the chips are actually getting really good at, at making them look almost identical. Now, unlike a, uh, you know, like a counterfeit bag or a counterfeit clothes or a counterfeit watch, at first glance, it is really hard to tell counterfeit chips from real chips. And in fact, they will oftentimes work very similarly to the real chip, but not quite because it's a bootlegged design. Um, and so there's a lot of these uh, uh, bootlegs going out right now. And it's, it's infecting not only hobbyists and people you know, building stuff for fun, but of course, these uh, bootleg chips also get into the mainstream supply chain as well. So it's a problem. I remember we bought some SD cards and some of them are counterfeit and we bought some RAM and some of those counterfeit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a common practice where what uh, some counterfeiters will do is uh, update some of the ROM on the uh, SD cards or on the flash memory to say that it's a larger value than it actually is. So if you put in a, say one gigabyte um, USB drive, uh, into your computer, it will report as being 64 gigabytes. Uh, and then it'll just fail once it, once you write over a gigabyte of data. Yeah, pretty nasty. Yep. Well, Urban has, says a Chrome can stop ransomware. That's interesting. Right. I, I uh, found that one to be interesting. It also ties with a article, or an article, a blog post from Google themselves about their five pillars as to why Chrome OS is safer because apparently it has it, its um, its OS is invisible to the user. It does updates behind the scenes. It's read only. It has safe browsing. The the Titan C chip. Uh, there's there's like five things that they have that that they emphasize are the reasons why Chrome OS is the better option. Well, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to believe this. I mean, I think if you're running Chrome OS, most of the ransomware malware would probably not run on it. That, that sounds plausible to me. I'd like to see like a test, but. That's what I want to see. I want to see a test. Yeah, but it sounds plausible on the face of it. 
Yeah, and then Alan's got Reality Winner got out. Yeah, I was glad to see that. Yeah, Reality Winner, who has since mostly been forgotten, but at the time was a big story in the news, ex-NSA contractor who leaked a classified document that um, showed that the uh, Russian intelligence service had been accessing the uh, U.S. voter rolls. Uh, she was convicted uh, to over five years of prison in 2018, but she's been released now and uh, she's in a halfway house at the moment. I think it's a good time to revisit this story because she was, uh, her sentence of over five years was the longest ever given to anybody who's leaked classified information in this way. Hmm. Uh, and far longer than say Scooter Libby uh, and Richard Armitage who leaked the identity of a CIA agent to the press in the form of political retaliation. So it's, it's not really unfortunate story. And, uh, you know, reality winner had to suffer this imprisonment for really a not very serious infraction, but one that um, I think the Trump administration tried to use as a punishment to get back at any kind of criticism of Trump and any kind of suggestion that uh, his election was perhaps fraudulent or uh, influenced by foreign intelligence. And this is not just some conspiracy theory that's um, been exploited for political gain like uh, in 2020 and the Republican party after the 2020 presidential election, this really did happen. There is valid intelligence that the 2016 election um, voting, maybe not the results, but the voting rolls were accessed by Russian intelligence. So yeah, it's a good time to remember this. That's the, one, the voting rolls. Now, of course, how would they use that? Is there any evidence they actually used it? Well, no, that's the thing is there's no evidence that Russian intelligence actually manipulated voting uh, results. But there is evidence that they hacked into a number of different local voting roll systems. Um, what they were trying to do, what they tried to accomplish, or what they may have actually done, we don't know, at least not publicly. Yeah. But, um, and the now the Republicans were, are people... pushing the big lie that the election was all corrupt. So it's, uh, it's not clear that this article is really against them. Well, it's true that uh, foreign uh, intelligence agencies have access to U.S. voting records. I mean, th this, this is as the 2016 election demonstrates. So all of this stop the steal talk is founded in some reality, at least reality of 2016. Unfortunately, if anything, the, uh, the uh, Russian intelligence favored uh, Trump. Yeah. So. And I think there's no evidence that they directly manipulated the votes. All they did was propaganda. Right, right. Which is probably a much more effective way to do the job. As it turns out, yes, absolutely. Anyway, I'm glad Reality Winter got out because it just, I agree with you, it just seemed outrageous that she gets punished so much. Our, uh, our justice system is remarkably unjust and corrupt lately, which is really a bad look. Yes, uh, indeed, indeed. And, and uh, you know, it, this was bad not only for um, the corruption of the U.S. Uh, federal government and the, um, the Justice Department, but also we left a black mark on uh, The Intercept, the publication that was responsible for yeah. well, identifying her in the first place. She sent a printout to The Intercept, and it was entirely because of their incompetence that... Uh, uh, winner was identified yeah yeah well the intercept seems to be kind of nuts and glenn greenwald seemed to be kind of nuts yeah although greenwald's no longer there i know the he rage quit after his own magazine yeah yeah right <laughs> it's but like the intercept yes no good yeah both you know you're really dealing with amateurs i don't know why you don't deal with somebody reputable like the washington post or new york times if you want to send secret information they actually have a real secret information submission portal which i think is set up by competent people mm -hmm. yeah yeah anyway all right and so this one i thought was really pretty big google workplace will now let you use google docs and share them and use 
end-to-end -end encryption so you handle the keys. So like iPhones, Google does not have access to the data at all. And this sounds pretty awesome. And the technical details are kind of interesting too. You have to use a key provider and they have a list of companies that you can choose as your key provider. So it'll be interesting to see if people test it and decide how secure this is and how these various key escrow agencies really work. But um, I, I'm sort of glad to see this. And I think all the privacy people should be glad to see this. That's one huge problem with Google Documents is Google has all your stuff. And that's probably really not okay if it's medical stuff or proprietary company secrets or government stuff. This seems like a big step forward. And it also, of course, means that if somebody goes to Google and says uh, with a subpoena and say, hand over the stuff, they really can say, we really don't have it. So uh, it's brand new and I'll be interested to see how well it works out in practice. Anyway, then we're back to Liz with uh, Clearview. Yes, so this was kind of an interesting uh, story in The Verge about um, uh, Clearview AI, which we've talked about in the past, uh, they run probably the biggest uh, photographic database uh, available to um, law enforcement in the U.S. And uh, it sure does have a lot of photos, three billion, in fact. Um, and, you know, these the, the service is pretty much just available to anyone who is law enforcement or claims to be law enforcement and buys a subscription to it, uh, which is pretty scary because they compiled the database just by scraping images from any and every source on the internet. Um, and, uh, you know, we talk a lot about countries like China and how they use this stuff but we're doing it here too. Um, and I think it's it's pretty important to consider that sort of thing. But um, in a way, that's really nothing more than what Google does, right? You search somebody's name, you find all their pictures that are labeled with their name. Mm, uh, this is a little more intensive than say a Google image search because uh, it, yeah, it scrapes pretty much every um, database there is. I wouldn't, and the article didn't, uh, article didn't uh, mention this, but I would not be surprised to see that it also uh, gets has uh, access to mug shots and stuff like that. Um, but uh, either way, if it wasn't Clearview, it'd be somebody else. Uh, but one of the interesting components of this article to me is that, um, and, and I didn't know about this, but last year, uh, some researchers at University of Chicago uh, came up with an interesting um, tool to, and the way this tool, it's called Fox, and the, as in Guy Fox, and it, the way that it works is it subtly alters parts of an image um, that uh, facial recognition software uses to dif differentiate uh, between different people. And uh, it, it alters that, but then it looks, the, the photo looks the same to the human eye. So it doesn't look any different to us, but it essentially scrambles the image so that um, facial recognition systems uh, can't recognize it, so to speak. Um, it's not super easy to implement, so it's probably not a panacea for stuff like this, uh, but it is, pretty interesting to consider that people are trying to work on ways to uh, get around it. The problem is, is that uh, you'd have to try and alter every single image about you, which just isn't possible. I mean, if you've had a article written about you and they used a headshot, good luck changing that. Um, you know, so it, it, it affects even people that aren't on social media, that aren't really using Instagram or Facebook or anything like that, um, it definitely affects them. And I think we, some of us who don't use social media get lulled into a false sense of complacency that um, we're not gonna have our, our, photo, our, our selfies and our photos end up in these databases, but they still totally do anyway. 
Yeah, yeah. It seems like, uh, you know, the whole concept of privacy has changed in the internet age, and there's no putting it back in the box. It is. And, and we try, like here in California, there are more controls. You're supposed to be able to request a copy of your data from any company that's assembled it on you. Uh, I've done this. It doesn't always work uh, because no one enforces it. Uh, you can make you can request it all you want. That doesn't mean you're going to get it. Um, there are also uh, you know deletion clauses where you can ask a company to delete all the data that they have on you, but that's not a permanent opt out. So theoretically, they could be in compliance by deleting your data on uh, on uh, July first and then um, assembling a fresh dossier on you starting July second. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, once something is out there going around the internet, there's just no getting rid of it, I think. Right. Yeah. All right. And so the end of Windows 10, that's why I thought I'd put this to title 11. Yes, yes. Well, we don't know if it's going to be 11 or what's going on. Uh, the Register has an article written by Tim Anderson uh, entitled, Mark Your Diaries, 14 October 2025 is the end of Windows 10. That's a bizarrely precise deadline. Yes, it is. So where did they get this, this date from? Well, Microsoft updated the product lifecycle documentation. Um, so every Microsoft version of software has a you know, end date and a you know, dates that it's, it's officially supported. And Windows 10 Home and Pro are no longer going to be supported on uh, the 14th of October, 2025. Now, this is kind of a, a bit of a, a shock because Windows 10 was supposed to be the end of Windows. You know, it was the end goal. Um, it was so big, they just skipped nine and just went straight to 10. It was the, the greatest operating system ever. Um, and, you know, Windows was finally complete and that all they were going to do is add little patches every six months. Uh, well, apparently not. Uh, it looks like Windows 10 is coming to an end uh, fairly soon. And... Uh, there's a fourth, there's a, there's an event starting on um, June 24th, uh, and it's assumed that at that event, Microsoft will be rolling out what the next version of, of Windows will be. So I don't know what changed Microsoft's mind. Um, I thought the Windows 10 being the end all version of Windows was a great idea after the shenanigans of Windows XP and Windows 7 and, and uh, Vista. What happened, of course, is that Microsoft's you know, had all these versions of Windows floating around and like no one wanted to like upgrade from XP. And, you know, they kept having to extend it and it was a big headache for everyone. And the idea of just saying, okay, just there's now just Windows, not all these different versions flying around, I thought was a great idea, but apparently Microsoft's not making enough money, so. Well, I'm not so sure I like Windows 10. The main thing about Windows 10 is since they just keep changing it every month and you have no choice, I would like do things and then they would stop working and buttons would vanish off the menus and stuff. It makes you feel like you're losing your mind. That is, that is true. Yes. Once in a while, Windows 10 changes the way that, that it handles things. And uh, suddenly you are, uh, you're a new, new territory and you don't even know how you got there. Yeah. For a lot of us, we'd rather have something stable that quits changing so we can adapt to it and trust it. Right. Well, I mean, and, but then again, you, you just get into the Windows XP situation again, where everyone has this stable version yep. that they trust and they, they know and they use day in and day out. And it's a great version of Windows, but it becomes outdated. And then. Um, well, and I think the real problem is Microsoft doesn't get any more money from you. For like yeah, yeah, that is that is the big deal. So apparently uh, what, what I was under the impression of was that Microsoft was moving towards these live services like Azure. And so Windows was sort of becoming a secondary product to them. Uh, so instead of relying, it, relying on Windows heavily for the revenue, they were going to switch to other sources and then just use Windows as sort of a marketing platform. Um, but apparently that's not really the case. Microsoft is still very much reliant on the revenue of Windows. Yeah. So. And so I think they need to have these theatrical uh, upgrades and Right, make people sell it more money for the newest version. Yeah, as a marketing trick, yeah. Yep. Yeah, all right. And um, then we got, your router is insecure. Irvin, are you sure about that? 
I mean, maybe this is a good article for those who want to play with their router. Mm -hmm. Has some nice, has some uh, good ideas for people to try, uh, along with some things that that are for those who don't have technical knowledge or too much technical knowledge that are able to play with their the router. And then there's a, a couple more things for those who want to venture out. He's saying they said this at Hope Ten. Did Hope just happen? Did I miss Hope? No, I thought Hope was canceled. Well, anyway, he says that Hope 10, somebody said all the router, home routers are unsafe, which I think has been well known for a long time. Anyway. Um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's one of those last year, useful last, articles. Last year was Hope 11, so that right. must have been like three years ago. Oh, these just reviews. This is just general information then. Yes. Yeah, yes. so I mean, general information. I remember they had a router hacking contest at DEF CON and everything, and they found out that like all these $30 routers you buy are, of course, ridiculously insecure, which is not too much of a surprise. Right, 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 right. To us, this article is nothing nothing new. But for those who don't have, who are learning from us by watching us, here's an article that they can yeah. use to, to try stuff on their routers. Yeah, and so how should you lock it down then? I want you to put on the uh, open source firmware or what? Well, the... The things that we have already uh, mentioned time and time again of not using WPS, of changing the, the password on the router, of uh, uh, enabling updates. Okay. Uh, yeah, th those simple things. Basic security. Basic uh, security, yeah. It's a good thought, though. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then Alan's got no code. So, what's no code? No code and low code is the future. That's what it is. It's, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. it's the idea, it's the dream that in the future, humans won't need to write code anymore, that AI will write all computer code for us. Like all you do is click and drag. And then the AI will figure out what it is that we want to do with our computer code and it will do it for us. That's all. Well, that could be. I mean, they say that the development environments are going to have more and more like suggestion, help, and AI guided uh, enhancements. So, no more computer science degrees. Well, plenty of security engineers trying to figure out what you've actually written and what it actually does. You know, this is not a new idea. It's been around for decades, and lots of companies have tried and failed to do this. But Gartner, which is a company that seems to exist to uh -oh. uh, not promote, compare them and yeah. ascertain which is best. Mm -hmm. Partner seems to think that by the year 2024, 80% of all technology products and services will be built by non IT professionals. And that a big part of this increase in efficiency and capability will be a result of no code and low code solutions. Um, this press release from Gartner is quite thin on specifics. So I'm really not sure how they arrived at this 80% and what they are counting as a technology product and service. But they seem to think that there's a clear trend that um, a lot of IT related things, whatever these things may be, um, no longer require the expertise of IT professionals, uh, be those uh, network administration, administrators, system administrators, or uh, programmers. Well, I guess it kind of makes sense. I mean, you can make a website by just clicking and dragging things, and I guess you can right. Android app the same way and so on. It kind of makes yes. sense. It does. It does. And there are more and more plat powerful platforms like Salesforce, for example, that allow somebody who uh, maybe they, they have some domain expertise, but they are not exactly a programmer. They're not a traditional IT professional. So, yeah, I, there is some legitimacy to this. The 2023 80% time frame, I don't know about that, but it is probably a trend and it's something certainly that we should be aware of moving forward. I mean, just look at what's happened to uh, network administrators. Um, that's, a, that's a job that's uh, somewhat under threat from, uh, from uh, developments. So 
they don't need as many of them because everything is uh, automated or something? Yeah, right. Well, that would be the brave new world where they automate us out of existence. Yeah. I don't think they're going to automate the security people out. Probably not, no. All right. And uh, so then California is opening up today. No more masks, pretty much. And uh, they have a list of where we have to wear masks still, which is basically airports and barge and buses, all public transport, we have to wear masks, and private businesses where they decide that they want people wearing all masks. Restrictions are being lifted. But other than that, we don't need to wear masks pretty much anywhere starting today. And uh, I'm happy to see that. I remember we went out to play golf on Sunday, and I said, this is really stupid. Here we are outside, and everybody has to wear masks. So I'm glad that's finally over. <laughs> But the thing that really caught my attention is Gavin Newsom is going to make a vaccine passport for California. Apparently, just like New York City, it's going to be an app on your phone. And holy cow, I bet we can hack that app. And, you know, uh, what could possibly go wrong? Oh, we've already seen what's going to go wrong. It went wrong in India and it's going wrong in New York City. In New York City, the database is not right. So you get the wrong data on the app. And in India, immediately people figured out how to make the app just display green health regard without even checking the database. And so anyway, um, we are going to have the whole circus of vaccine passports here in California. God have mercy on us. So, And this is, of course, why the college hasn't yet decided whether they're opening for face-to-face -face classes, because nobody knows what's going on at all. We don't know if we're going to have passwords. You don't know if you need to have passports. Oh, mine, mine uh, I did an about face and said, yes, we're going to do a 60% in person and 40% hybrid and all faculty had uh, had an issue with that and they brought the union in. It's been a, a nonstop fight at Cabrillo right now between the president who wants 60% back and the union who's going no. I know and I, that fight hasn't even begun at City College yet but I'm sure that's what's going to happen. They will make some decision and everybody will scream about it and they'll fight back and forth and probably the semester is going to start and we're still not going to know what we're doing. <laughs> Yeah. Why, uh, why did the union say no? I mean, I think that, you know, if you're vaccinated, you're good to go. And if you're not, then you ought to be able to teach remotely. Uh, that my, that's what my thought, but apparently they felt out of the loop. Okay. In the emails, they, they weren't part of the decision-making process. It sure. was just made without them there at the table. So that's I nice. guess they are mad at that and are causing mayhem. And I think the underlying thing is the same as the K through 12 teachers. They just don't feel safe. And, you know, there is now talk of a, uh, there's now a new variant that actually punches through one of the vaccines, although not the vaccines in America. So they're not entirely wrong True. That, uh, that there is some risk. I just think it, my, my, my assessment of the risk analysis is that you can just forget about this risk and get on with your life. But other people are very, very afraid. Seems like you ought to be able to opt in to teaching in person if you want to. And seems like it. That seems to be the wise thing, but that's not that's not what Cabrillo is doing. But but see, to be fair, if they were to let ten percent of the teachers opt into teaching, then that would mean all the campus cops and all the clerical staff and all the support staff has to go to work face to face to support that, and they might not really want to do that. And then there's the cost. Like if you had to install plexiglass barriers between all the seats and special ventilators or something, that would cost a lot of money. And nobody really knows if you need to do that or what the rules are. That's the thing. You really need the government to like issue clear recommendations. Yeah, that seems to have been a running theme that, that that's been an issue since the start of this whole deal. Yeah, you know, we're a pretty disorganized country. It's got its virtues, but it's got its flaws too. But the state could issue a recommendation. And anyway, I guess they're going to issue some recommendation about vaccine passports, and maybe that will create a new entertaining level of confusion to throw on top of it all. I mean, I'm, in, I'm in no rush to return to working in person just because it's been nice avoiding the commute. But I do know that uh, you know there is a small proportion of our students who are just completely hopeless and lost without lab access and one-on-one yeah. -on -one help. So yeah, that's why I want to get back so I can have the lab again. I mean, the lectures online are okay, but but there's some of them really need that hands-on lab help. Yep. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, then I think we're back to Liz with the guns are vanishing. 
Yeah, this was a very interesting story from the Associated Press. It's quite a long and comprehensive article, but I thought it was pretty interesting that, you know, with a lot of the, there are a lot of um, interesting uh, variables that don't get considered uh, with a lot of the gun law debates. And this is one of them that I hadn't really considered, but uh, turns out that the, um, De Department of Defense has a little problem with uh, guns going missing from the U US military and they turn up in some interesting places, um, often being used in the commission of violent crimes. Um, and it seems that there is some debate between uh, different officials as to just how many weapons are missing. and. Um, I probably should clarify that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not just, it isn't just guns that goes go missing. It's also stuff like uh, armor piercing grenades uh, that ended up in a backyard in Atlanta. Um, or uh, one example from the story that I thought was pretty terrifying and interesting um, is just from, uh, it's from very recently, it's from last month, and I did not hear about this on the news. Uh, but this uh, army trainee, uh, apparently, I don't know if he went nuts or what, but he uh, boarded a school bus full of children uh, near the base and held the driver and the students hostage with his uh, assault rifle that he'd taken from the base. Yeah, I think I saw the article about that one. Um, you know, there are some pretty weak controls on a lot of these weapons and some of them get you know, some of the ways that they listed that they had uh, gotten stolen were pretty, um, pretty damning. Uh, uh, some of them had had just been left unsecured behind unlocked doors or, um, uh, you know, in supply ships, warehouses, stuff like that. Um, uh, some of some of them had been stolen uh, out from under the noses of sleeping troops. Uh, there was a, a surveillance system that didn't record um, guarding some of the weapons. Uh, yep. Plenty of break-ins, all kinds of all kinds of ways that these these weapons just find their way out into the public. So, yep, just like our networks, you know. Exactly. Um, lots of lots of weaknesses. Um, lots of weaknesses in our physical security here. I heard a lot of stories like that. So, um, the army is full of the kind of corporate dysfunction that we talk about, where there's many different layers of of control, and they don't talk to each other, and they undo each other's work and stuff. It is, but it's also, you know, not just the army. It's some, some, it's some of the elite fighting units, like from the Marines and the Navy SEALs and stuff. And uh, one of the, you know, one of the interesting things here that again, just like, uh, just like cybersecurity, uh, one of the biggest issues here is insider threats because you'll have. Uh, you know, lower ranked, lower paid service members who think that they can realize they can make a quick buck uh, off of selling some of these weapons, so they do. Yeah, and that's been the case for for decades. The yes. supply officers pilfering the stuff. Yep. Yeah. I remember I, one of my military friends talked about a Navy ship where they had the newest brand new helicopter that was their super prototype, and they put it on this aircraft carrier and took it out to sea, and somebody, then the ship, a wave came and chipped the ship and it just slid right off and hit the ground, hit the water and bloop, 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 bloop. Nobody ever like thought to tie it down. <laughs> and they're like looking at each other, uh, what do we put in the report that will make it sound like we didn't just forget to tie it down? <laughs> anyway. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, well, and that's part of the problem. They really try to avoid reporting this stuff whenever possible. Uh, yeah. Don't don't want to you know heads will roll. They don't want to get in trouble. So it makes and it may also makes it easier to downplay 
uh, the number of weapons that went missing when people come asking questions. You can just say, oh, it was just a few hundred uh, here or there, no big deal, <laughs> even if it was a lot more than that. I know, and, and this, I remember that there was a, one of these cases where the cops killed an unarmed black man for no good reason, and they, um, a couple of them, they, the police report shows uh, he collapsed and died for no apparent reason and no shots were fired. That's their summary of the situation when they just strangled him to death. Right. It's a total mystery. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's that way when people write their own explanations of things. And a lot of breach notifications are that way. Uh, these super advanced attackers came in and took us down and we did everything we could and called the FBI. And, you know, it turns out they just clicked on a phishing link. Anyway. Right. And, and, and nothing important was taken. Meanwhile, it's their whole customer database with all yeah. the PII. I, I like LinkedIn that just tried to say they didn't get our passwords when a bunch of us were saying, dude, I looked in a database and found my password. Dude, they got <laughs> your passwords. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Well, surprise, surprise, the government does the same thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, Caitlin's got what's clearly the most important story. It's got like a logo. Yes. And stuff. Mistune. Yes, we have a vulnerability with a logo. Therefore, it is important. That's right. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's an entire web page um, uh, basically going over a bug called Mistune. Uh, Mistune is a vulnerability that has been around since like iOS 2 and 4. <laughs> I mean, it's just been sitting there. And the article, does, or sorry, the page does not go into super details about how this works. But from what I can gather, if you click on a certain link that ties to iTunes, uh, it will apparently open up some sort of like Safari, and then you can run JavaScript, and then you can get outside of the Safari sandbox and start writing and start running bytecode uh, using this bug. Um, it has been patched, uh, but what's really sort of amazing is that this has been sitting here uh, on everybody's iPhones uh, since you know the mid 2000s, um, just waiting to get uh, exploited or found. I mean, yeah. So mm -hmm. sounds pretty complicated too. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Uh, it, apparently, it's not as complicated as some of the jailbreaks. Um, I mean, it's not a kernel based. You know, exploit. Uh, it's just a link that you can use to, like I said, run Safari within iTunes and get out of there. So he did get a CVE number. Did he get a payout for this or anything? It doesn't say. I, it does not say. Like I said, the details are a bit sparse, but I do hope that the person who found this uh, gives a talk at DEF CON or something about, about this vulnerability, because it, it seems pretty interesting. Uh, like I said, I, I don't think it's it's necessarily the most um, compromising vulnerability, but the fact that it's just been sitting there for as long as it was um, mm -hmm. is just a bit concerning. Yeah, I hear about quite a few of those. Yeah. yeah. All right, and Urban's got uh, virus total. Uh, this little thing uh, is great. This M scan is great for those who have to deal with air gapped machines. Mm -hmm and uh, need to run things with virus total, but you know, because it's air gap, they can't run around. So mscan, you can uh, run on that air gap machine, pick whatever files you want. It'll create a QR code that you would then scan with a phone and that information would be sent over to virus total and there's your result. I think this is a great little handy dandy tool uh, to help those who need to work with air gap systems. Uh, it makes sense. And that little QR code basically is just a hash. Yeah, I'm sure that's just a hash. Yeah, but that's still a pretty good idea. Um, yeah, all right. And Alan's got uh, employees who all want to quit. Yes, or at least 41% of them are thinking about quitting because they're unhappy with work of all kinds, or at least the jobs they've got, and they're reconsidering their life priorities. So One of the consequences great. of the pandemic and work from home appears to be that uh, people, at least those people who are lucky enough to work in better paid jobs that allow them to work remotely are reconsidering whether or not they want to continue working at their jobs. And this is according to a Microsoft survey in which they unearthed a number of interesting trends, 
including 46% of the workforce plans to move because now they can work remotely. Whether that's a short distance move or a long distance move, they don't make clear, but that's nearly half the workforce. Um, also, there has been a quintupling of the number of job postings on LinkedIn that specify remote work. So clearly employers are beginning to respond to this trend. Um, and then there's some other maybe more negative trends such as uh, meeting times have uh, doubled for team users since uh, uh, February of 2020 and 40 billion more emails are being sent now uh, than in 2020. So some good things, some not so good things, but it is clear that a lot of people are either very interested in working remotely or perhaps interested in not working at all, at least for the time being, um, in part because they're feeling very burned out uh, or they have decided to reprioritize their lives. Yeah, well, this has been the promise of the internet for like 40 years is that if you don't have to commute to work anymore, we'll just do everything over the web. Yeah, and maybe it's finally coming true. And I don't think it was ever, well, I, don't, I shouldn't say ever, but I don't think in the past 10 years, it's been a technological issue. Instead, it's just been a management issue and work expectation issue and uh, control I would of labor. That it's issue. still an, a broadband penetration issue. <laughs> Well, okay, yes, that is very, very true. And I can vouch for that. And I'm sure yeah. Liz can too. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> at least it's in many places, issue. Uh, in the suburbs and exurbs, yeah. there is decent, I think there's decent, well, maybe not in Liz's case, yeah. but there can be decent <laughs> broadband I mean, coverage. My parents, my parents got fiber in the rural rural Midwest uh, before I did here in the Bay Area, so it's just uneven. Yeah, I it's totally uneven, and I can't even get fiber in downtown San Francisco. So go figure. Well, I know about that one. That's a political issue. Yeah, but that's amazing that you can't get it in downtown SF. I know eight yeah. years ago you couldn't yeah. get it, and it was because the Board of Supervisors wanted everybody to have fiber, but Gavin Newsom wanted everybody to have Wi-Fi, and so they both blocked each other's proposals so nobody could get anything. Oh. Which is I a typical San that. Francisco response to problems. That seems like a typical California politics response to problems. You know, this is why I keep saying it would be nice if we actually had a Republican Party, because when Democrats run unchained, they do kind of make a stupid mess out of everything. And if there was a second party in America that made any sense, we might have some balance. But out here we have the perfect left-wing utopia, where they get to run unfettered as far as they want to go. Anyway, so the last one here I thought was great was Mr. Trash Wheel, which is Mr. Trash Wheel has a Twitter account in um, Baltimore. They got tired of all the trash flowing in the river, so they just built a cute little floating barge with a conveyor belt and some uh, floats to steer the trash in, and it sweeps the trash off the river and puts it in dumpsters that they haul away, and it's a big hit. Everybody loves it. They built like five more, and uh, they put a Twitter account, and they post like pictures of it sucking up the trash and people taking care of it and stuff. It seems like a great idea. And um, I got this from Holly's Manky Moggies, which I highly recommend. This is the most fun Twitter account in the world. This woman, before the pandemic, she was supposed to have a roommate and her roommate flaked out. So she couldn't pay for the rent. So she started a care home for disabled cats. And she had like eight disabled cats there. And she said, I'll just make like a GoFundMe page or something where people can subscribe just to see videos of my cats and she has the cutest cats in the world and people pay for the videos and now she's making a living this way, which is, and she posts fun things like uh, Mr. Trash Wheel on there. So I highly recommend it. Other people complain and say Twitter is all full of negativity and toxicity, but I don't have that experience probably because I follow people like this and serious security people. And I usually never even know about the Twitter dramas. Anyway, well, that's it for today. And what is it, Tuesday? We'll be back on Friday. Farewell. <laughs>